Welcome to Hoobie's Garage, the dumbest automotive channel in all of YouTube. And this is my wife's 2017 Land Rover Range Rover supercharged long wheelbase. And we bought it almost exactly one year ago. Now, my daily driver is a 1994 Chevrolet Suburban alternating with a 2003 Mercedes G55 with 230,000 miles. But my wife needs something nice, something that won't leave her on the side of the road. So I thought, well, Range Rover. Now I know Range Rover doesn't have the best reputation for reliability, but this thing's fairly new. 2017, it only had 37 or 38,000 miles uh, when we bought it. And I bought it with a full bumper to bumper warranty covering this thing until 2024 and something like 100,000 miles. And in this first year of ownership, even though this thing is pretty new, it did get well used in the first year of ownership. So today we are going to document the one year ownership experience of this Range Rover. What we like about it, what we don't like about it, what broke, and the most ridiculous part of owning this Range Rover. Really, it is so ridiculous. I never imagined buying this car and being in the position that I'm in. There's really no other word for it other than ridiculous. But before we dive into the ridiculousness, I'd like to thank Manscaped for sponsoring today's video. Last month they sent me this, their Lawnmower 3.0 among other things, and it's a very effective delicate tool to use around your delicate tools. And this month they've sent me another package which I shall open now. Yes, we have, well, starting with some boxer briefs, I'll try these on later, and packaging for it. Oh. A t-shirt as well that says, we save balls. More on that in a little bit, but I'll put it on for now. Wear two t-shirts, Doug DeMuro style. Yes. There we go. Have your crop mop ball wipes and the foot duster, foot deodorant, and the Plow 2.0, a nice safety razor. Manscaped, in addition to providing the right tools and solutions for safe and easy manscaping, has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to spread awareness for men's health. Did you know that one man every hour and every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? So it's really important to check yourself regularly. And you can perform simple routine self-checks at home while enjoying Manscaped products like their Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Mop Ball Wipes, and the Lawn Mower for extra visibility. So visit manscaped.com TCS to learn how to check yourself for early signs of cancer and share their funny informational videos that can help save lives and balls. As always, you can support me and my generous sponsor by purchasing products and using the code Hoovies for 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Now back to landscapers or uh, Land Rovers, Land Rovers, yes, Land Rovers. So now let's get into the one year experience of owning this Land Rover Range Rover long wheelbase supercharged and uh, why I bought it over all the luxury competition. To recap, I traded in my wife's 2017 Mercedes E-Class wagon that I really bought because I wanted it for myself. We bought it before the baby came and I didn't fit the car seat to it. And it seems like newer Mercedes, especially E-Class, don't have the rear leg room of the older Mercedes because when we installed that car seat, uh, there was no room in the front passenger seat. You had to put the seat so far forward that your knees were basically in the dash and it was super uncomfortable. So I wanted to overcompensate for that mistake and a long wheelbase Range Rover is a very, very good way to do that. This extra several inches of room in the rear, basically this rear door is much larger, makes the car seat well, seem small. It's basically a limousine back here. And that's why I was drawn to it. I was also drawn to the 510 horsepower supercharged V8 as engines get smaller and turbocharged. This still has an old school big V8 under the hood, but with all the latest modern technology. And it is an absolutely gorgeous vehicle. Inside, it's a great mix of old and new as well. Great old school build quality with the materials and the finishes in here, but with the latest modern technology. Now the technology may not be as good as some of its German 
competition inside, it is one of my gripes, but the quality overall of the vehicle, just in the fit and finish, is so much better than really any domestic vehicle being made right now. And even most German automakers don't have an interior as nice as this. You really have to go up to Bentley or Rolls-Royce to get something this nice on the inside. And those, well, a Bentayga's a $250,000 car and a Rolls-Royce Cullinan's $450,000, $500,000. This is way cheaper than that. It's $130,000 new and I bought it for, well, half of its MSRP. Yeah, basically half of MSRP for a three-year-old Range Rover with 38,000 miles. We have put 12,000 miles on it. It's now at 50,000 miles, had one service, and there are a lot of things that I like about this, but a few things that I don't. So we'll take it out for a drive now, and I will list all those things along with what is broken and what has been the really, really ridiculous part of owning this Range Rover for the last year. I know this is my wife's car, but every chance I get to drive it, I do drive it, and it is very nice. All the things I talked about that I liked with it, uh, why we bought it, it continues. The comfort, the quality of the interior, it's so nice. The engine, it's just ridiculous. There it goes. Ridiculous, ridiculous power. But then there's the ride quality as well. The air suspension was designed primarily for off-roading. You could raise it up and have all different kind of trains here if you turn the switches. I've never turned those switches. Like most people that own these things, this Range Rover has never been off-road and it will probably never go off-road. I just like the ride quality of it. It is so, so good. And it's why I'm really happy with my choice versus say buying a new Defender for the same money. I think a new Defender well-equipped is around $70,000 and it wouldn't be as good as this. It doesn't have the same ride quality, the comfort in the seats. It doesn't have the big 510 horsepower V8 either. So you're giving up a lot for something that looks arguably cooler and has more off-road cred, but uh, I mean, really, I don't care about that kind of stuff. I think most people would prefer something like this used that's not gonna depreciate that much or, or at all, more, more on that in a little bit and have all of these nice comforts. It's, it's really, really, really good. Also kind of surprising is how easy it is to drive this big old school bus. The turning radius is actually really good and it feels really easy to drive. My wife had a few big SUVs before this. She was always curving the wheels and bumping things. Maybe she needed to get used to big SUVs, but she hasn't put a single mark in this one. And I think it's also because this thing is just so easy to drive. There are some things that we definitely don't like though. And a lot of it has to do with the electronics down here. You really need to be patient if you own one of these cars and want to use a lot of the infotainment things. Because when you first started up, just when you started up to get going, it takes a while for this knob to present itself and then for it to wake up so you can turn the knob and put it in gear. And then say you want to turn on your heated seats. Well, you have to push this button here and then toggle through the infotainment screen. If it starts up right away, sometimes it resets and takes a long time to start up, but it's always super duper laggy and quite annoying because between that and turning your heated seats on, you're like waiting 30 seconds before you can set off. Sometimes if things really feeling slow, it, it's just kind of annoying. Another thing you probably saw there when I turned was that sudden surge of acceleration. And what happens is when I want to go faster, this thing starts off in second gear, I floor it and there's a massive delay because it's shifting from second to first and then just goes because this thing has so much torque. So passengers are looking at you like, what the heck are you doing? And it's, it's not your fault. It's the Range Rover's crummy computer just kind of trying to figure out what you want. And it's, it's weird. I pulled into the Land Rover dealership just to look and see really thin inventory right now. Not very much out there. Inventory is really thin here like everywhere else, but the service experience has been very good so far. Uh, let's get into what broke. A little side note, I got to point this out first though. That is an S350 diesel all-wheel drive. The last S-Class diesel for sale. I looked it up, $28,000. That's, that's really a, a cool vehicle. But anyway, what broke on this Land Rover? Well, a year into it, just right when I wanted to get it serviced, but it wasn't giving me a service warning about 12,000 miles in a, a year later, it started leaking coolant and it leaked a lot of coolant. Another thing I was noticing was this slight clunk. So I called to make a service appointment and was going through their switchboard, I think in Minnesota or something like that. And they said at first that they couldn't get me in in two weeks, which is 
silly. Obviously, things looking cool, you need to get it in right now. So thankfully, I have relationships with people who actually work in the physical dealership, and they were able to get me right in. It's a smart thing to do. Have your service advisor card so you can call them directly, not work a switchboard. Got the car in. It was leaking from a little coolant line that goes around the supercharger. There's a bunch of little ones. Uh, not a big deal. An easy fix there. And actually, there's no parts disruption, unlike a lot of automakers, to where they're able to get the part within a few days. So we weren't out of the car for very long. The suspension clock was due to the middle control arms. This thing has three control arms because it's a, a beefy off-roader. And one side looked way worse than the other, which led to a little bit of uneven tire wear as well. That was all warranty except for the tire. Unfortunately, I'm still rolling on it, uh, but uh, all that was free. It's probably gonna be about $1,000 worth of stuff that broke, so not that bad. Not like the Doug DeMiro Range Rover of back in the day, but still nice to have that warranty until 2024. We are now at 50,000 miles, so we are out of the factory warranty completely now and reliant on the certified pre-owned warranty. But I do have a few more things in the gripe category before we get back to the garage and talk about the ridiculous part of owning this Range Rover and one of them is the service intervals. Land Rover recommends that you service their cars every year or 15,000 miles. And I was told that some vehicles are gonna have it at two years and like 20,000 miles, which is absolutely, absolutely stupid and insane. The reason they do this is to try and save money in the service costs for the customer, which is a nice thing. And in consumer reports, they look like they're a cheaper car to own long-term, but in the long-term, you don't want to have those kind of oil change intervals on any vehicle. When I was working at a BMW dealership back in 2007, we had the same service intervals with BMWs and it was sludging up the engines. It's the dark ages of BMWs, I think partially because of those oil change intervals. I was freaking out when I realized I'd driven this thing 12,000 miles without an oil change, so I got it in about, well, a month early on the service. And I would already be super apprehensive about buying one of these when they reach hoopty level status just because of all the electronics, but taking the service intervals on top of that and the sludging up of the engines, I would be really, really worried. So I imagine values are going to tank eventually. Not, not now, it's really weird, but eventually. Another slight annoyance has been with the app. I have an app where I can remote start this thing and it expired in a year and I needed to renew it and I didn't renew it on the day it expired. Um, so I tried to renew it, paid the money, and it's still not working in the car. I tried to call to get it activated and uh, the hold time was too long, so I just, I gave up. I probably could get it handled here at the dealership real easy, but I've just been lazy. So kind of my fault there, but uh, look at all these beautiful hoopties here. There's one thing my accountant told me, uh, I've been talking a lot more to my accountant ever since the tax situation that uh, I got myself in uh, with the Lamborghini purchases that were paid for with, uh, well, well, tax money basically. And he said, one thing I could do to write off, uh, say, a car is to lease one. And if I leased one brand new, then I could write off the lease payments. Now, I'm not really a new car guy doing new car reviews, uh, but what do you think about me leasing something? The one that catches my eye is the Taycan and the Taycan Turbo Turbo S. That black one there, the Turbo's a 2020. Uh, I can get that one for over $20,000 off of its MSRP put it in a lease. Or that new cherry red 2021 Turbo Hess, which is an absolutely beautiful car. 2.6 second, zero to 60. Basically the best that electric cars have to offer right now and really uncharted waters. Nobody's really driving the heck out of these things and doing product reviews. Well, there's a plane landing right there. But I'm a hoopty man. Now I would really love a new 911, uh, but the salesman of the dealership tells me that they're getting one that is unsold for the entire year, one 911. Everything else is pre-sold, which is just absolutely crazy. Everything is so crazy right now. They said that they'd be completely out of inventory in a month if all of them met their sales quota just because they can't get cars right now, which is really sad and crazy, which actually leads to the ridiculous part of this video. What has been so ridiculous about this Range Rover, which we'll talk about back in my garage. So some gripes and some issues, but overall the ownership experience of this Range Rover has been absolutely incredible. And now we can get to the ridiculous part. Now, if this ownership experience had not been incredible, I'm in a very, very rare position right now where I went onto a car lot at a franchise dealer, bought a Range Rover, drove it for a year, and now I could sell it for easily more than 
what I paid for it. So I bought this thing for about $65,000 a year ago, and that wasn't the cheapest certified pre-owned Range Rover in the USA. It was, it was a good deal, but it wasn't the cheapest. It was just a good deal and drove it for a year. It now has 50,000 miles on it. And I decided to look up the wholesale value. The MMR, which is basically Mannheim's market resource tool where you scan the VIN and it tells you what they sell for at auction. And the wholesale value currently of this Range Rover is $65,000. That's what few have come to market at auction. And they're all looking like their lower condition report cars that have had accident history, prior paint, not as nice as this. Now, if you look for certified pre-owned 2017 Range Rovers with around the same miles right now, well, they want over $70,000 for them. If you jump forward a year into 2018, which would be like me buying a car now versus a year ago, the local dealer actually has a 2018 Range Rover just like this, same specs, same miles, same CPO. It's $90 thousand dollars a lot of these are in the higher 70s too these 2017s are in the higher 70s for cpo so chances are i could list this thing for like sixty nine thousand six hundred ninety six dollars nice and sell the car like that because it still has a warranty till 2024 I i'm not going to do that though because i can't replace it and the reason for this ridiculous situation that i find myself in is a perfect storm when it comes to new and used cars that is completely disrupting, really destroying the car market right now. Of course, you know what happened last year, the shutdown and everything. It really disrupted the supply of new cars. And now that we're coming out of the darkness, hopefully, of what was 2020, 2021 has tons of demand, tons of pent up money from people wanting luxury items like this and production just can't keep up. Some automakers well, can't produce at all because they quit their suppliers a year ago from supplying things like microchips. And now they're ramping up production as much as they can because they're selling cars before they hit the lots. That's why you look at car lots across the United States right now and they're all parked diagonally to try and fill up as much space as possible. Basically all the lots are empty and they can't even ramp up production right now. I was reading this article this morning where it said Ford and Stellantis, that's like Chrysler, Jeep, Fiat, they are out 80,000 vehicles last week. That's the shortage because of microchips. They stopped supplying microchips a year ago and now, they, well, they ran out. They can't ramp up production fast enough and these cars, Fords, can't be built because they don't have the microchips to run these very electronically dependent cars. This is what's unbelievable. Ford said last week that its Chicago and Flat Rock plants, as well as the F-150 and transit van sides of its Kansas City plant will be down the weeks of May 3rd and 10th as the automaker continues to get pummeled by the semiconductor crisis. 30,000 vehicles from Stellantis, 14,700 Jeep Grand Cherokees, 5,600 Dodge Durangos, and General Motors also thinks about 4,900 Chevrolet Express vans they won't be able to make as well. So they can't make new cars right now and there's a huge demand for them. So prices on used cars are actually literally higher than new cars. It's absolutely insane. Another thing happening is all the rental car fleets. They sold them all off in 2020 because everybody was locked down and now rental car demand is huge and rental car companies are buying up used cars to replenish their stock. When I was in Arizona at Barrett Jackson, you couldn't get a rental car, a compact car, and I couldn't even get it because it was sold out was $400 a day, $400 a day, and you couldn't get an Uber either because most people had just gotten their stimulus money. They were sitting at home. They didn't need the extra money working side gig at Uber, so you couldn't get a ride anywhere. It, it really was crazy. This is the dumbest automotive channel in all of YouTube. I don't think of myself as a savvy buyer flipping cars for massive profits. I usually lose money and well i'm definitely not an economist to say well this is hyperinflation and everything's expensive now look at lumber look at everything i don't really know but pretty much everything that i own is worth more money and i never intended for that to happen my ferrari 348 for instance i bought it for thirty-five thousand dollars almost two years ago i imagine even with the time mileage and its weirdness i could sell it for forty-five thousand dollars snap in a second my mercedes sls amg is probably a better example though the cheapest one for sale right now is like hundred and sixty thousand dollars that's like fifty thousand dollars more than what i paid for mine and mine is it's not a hoopty it's thirty-six thousand miles clean history it's it's 
not a hoopty, so I have no idea what's going on. And speaking of hoopties, even hoopty prices are absolutely insane. As a lot of you know, I was a car dealer in a previous life, 10 years in the car business. I thought living through cash for clunkers was insane, but I can't imagine being a used car dealer like my friend Urination Bob right now. He is having to get very, very creative when it comes to buying cars. Normally, he buys six to 10 cars a week at auction, and in the last two, three weeks, he's bought exactly zero cars. I tag along with him at the auctions and the wholesale bidding just, just for fun because I used to love doing that kind of stuff. And most recently, the craziest one that I can remember is a 2013 BMW X3 that had around 100,000 miles on it. The retail on it thing, Kelly Blue Book, was like $13,000. Well, it sold for $12,000 and it needed a lot of work. It sold for $4,000 more than what Bob bid on it. It's absolutely insane. The good news is when Urination Bob does get a hold of something, he's able to sell it very quickly. And if not, he's able to sell it at auction for more than what he paid for it. He's making money selling cars at the wholesale auction. So it's not all bad, but eventually all this inventory is going to dry up just, just like houses right now. I think in my area, there's like 12 houses in the school district that everybody wants for sale and prices are just skyrocketing. Going off on a tangent here, but uh, basically, to summarize, this Range Rover, lovely, lovely vehicle. I would recommend owning them under a CPO warranty. It's been a great one year in a really, really weird, ridiculous year. Thank you for watching.